Good afternoon. On behalf of Mercy University's Center for Career and Professional Development, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Cindy Strobridge, Director of Employer Relations and Special Events, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Our webinar today is about writing an effective resume. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. This webinar is expected to last approximately 30 minutes, and with time permitting, questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, you may submit that through our Zoom group chat box. At this time, this presentation is being recorded. You'll be able to view the recording later on on our YouTube channel, and a link to the recording will be sent out to all who have registered. Now I want to introduce one of our presenters, Kim Meredith. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kim Meredith. I'm the Assistant Director for Mercy University's Center for Career and Professional Development. I'm also uh, a Mercer alumni. I graduated from the main campus as well as the Atlanta campus with my grad degree. And I'm celebrating my 14th year here in the Career Center. And I'm very, very pleased to be offering a very important and hot topic, resume writing today. So the slide that we have in front of us, I think we're just gonna jump right in and understanding um, a little bit about um, some background information about our information today. Because as we think about resume writing, there's some things we need to consider. The Mercer Center for Career and Professional Development offers a, swole, a full suite of career consultation services to Mercerians free of charge, and that's during enrollment. But even after graduation, we do serve alumni free of charge for life. And so our CCBD team over the years has begun to describe career seekers really of all degree levels in three basic categories. You'll see these on the screen. Uh, we serve career starters. Sometimes that may be a restarter, but a starter nonetheless. And career changers, certainly many of those, as well as career advancers. And these three categories of career seekers certainly uh, can be studying at Mercer in really any degree level, undergraduate or graduate, or perhaps professional. So just real quick, I'd like to take just a moment um, to poll our audience today to see um, what audience we have today. And I see many of you have already responded. And I see those results. Thank you so much. It looks like we have a nice split audience of career starters, changers, and advancers, which is to be expected. It's, it's really one third in each. And so this really describes the day-to-day -day work of the Career Center staff as we really do serve um, all three categories. I'd like to point out today that the information in the webinar is going to provide expert resume writing advice that's appropriate and recommended for all three categories of career seekers. So allow me just for a moment to introduce our, our expert speaker today, Hugh Hunter. And Hugh got his undergraduate degree from Emory University in Atlanta. And he got his master's degree in business management and marketing uh, from Wake Forest University School of Business. He's been in corporate marketing as well as higher education. And he is a certified professional resume writer through the Professional Association of Resume, resume Writers and Career Coaches. And most recently, the founder of Not Your Average Resume, professional resume writing service. And I'm very pleased to have Hugh join us today. We have a great deal of confidence and Hugh has a lot of experience with all three categories of, of job and career seekers. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. You forgot like the most important thing, which is that I am a former CCPD team member, which is so near and dear to my heart. So I really appreciate the chance to come back um, and work with uh, the Mercer community on this. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a few goals uh, for this webinar that I want to make sure that we can, can attain over the course of the time. First one is just to bring clarity to the purpose of, you know, what a resume is supposed to do for you. I ask this question a lot when I start to work with clients and I get a ton of different answers, but I want to make it really plain and simple. And hopefully it's something that you can take with you and always sort of call back. I want to distinguish between resume formats, different formats, and their optimal uses. 
I want to make sure that you understand the, the different parts of resumes. Uh, they're very subjective, but there's a few core components that uh, you know, we expect to see in, in all professional resumes and how you can manipulate those to, to make sure that you're telling the story that you need to tell to serve yourself. Uh, and then I want to distinguish between a few different sort of nuances in the strategy uh, for your career starters, uh, you know, career relaunchers, career advancers. Uh, I want to I want to make sure that I hit on a couple of things that will give you some clarity in the difference of how you should be approaching your resume writing uh, based on which which category you fall into. So. First objective, we can get out of here really quickly. Uh, the purpose of your resume is to secure an interview, is to impress uh, a, a resume reviewer enough to make them curious enough to want to call you in and know more about your experience and know more about who you are as a professional. Nothing more, nothing less. Resumes don't get you jobs. <laughs> they don't uh, summarize the entirety of all of your experiences. If you think about what needs to go on this resume in order that I can, you know, have the best possibility to secure an interview, then that sort of logic can help answer a lot of your other questions. I like to describe resumes as flyers or advertisements. If you think about a flyer for, for a party, uh, then, you know, it'll have the address of the party, probably the title of it, um, the date, the time, and the cost. If you get to the party and then there's food there or there's a performer there that you didn't expect, there are so many different other elements to what might happen once you get to the party. Uh, but on the flyer, all you needed was the essential information. And so that's how I like to think about resumes. There's a lot of stuff in, uh, in our work histories that we may be sentimental about or you know, think is really cool to us, but not sure if it comes across the same way to a resume reviewer. And a lot of times, less is more when it comes to, to deciding, you know, what's going to be the most pertinent information to help you secure an interview. So the resume components, these are the components that I was mentioning uh, in terms of, you know, what we're looking at when we structure these documents, uh, your format, your content, and your design. So I'm going to talk about each of those in a little more detail as we move forward. Uh, describe what they mean and some ways that we can use them to our advantage. I'm going to start with design uh, because it's normally the biggest roadblock for a lot of my clients. Uh, and I want to talk about applicant tracking systems. Some of you may have heard of these before. They're basically the computer programs that uh, organizations, corporations use to scan resumes and determine which candidates should be referred to HR personnel to bring in for an interview. Uh, and so very quickly, what happens is you'll submit your resume, the resume will be scanned, uh, it will be matched to the job description that you applied for, and then based on the overlap between your resume and that job description, your resume will be giving a, given a score. Uh, once it gets that score, you're of course ranked among all the other candidates uh, that have been given scores. And then, you know, each organization functions differently after that. Uh, some organizations may pull all of the resumes. Some may pull the top 20 scores. You never really know. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, you are having a resume that's optimized for that process that makes it such that when you submit your resume, you're able to have, you know, the, uh, the best score that you can have. One uh, barrier to this is having a resume that's not ATS optimized. And when I say that, I mean resumes that use uh, templates most of the time. If you download a template offline uh, or you download a template from your word processor and you just fill your information in, there's usually a lot of formatting in those resumes that uh, will hinder the process of an applicant tracking system to scan it. So things like text boxes, tables, shapes and objects, images, those are going to be things that, you know, basically give an error message when they get into an applicant tracking system. And your, your score may end up zero just because it can't be read. So I say that people should have a resume per purpose. You know, if you have one resume for each purpose that you're trying to achieve, and I think, you know, I recommend to clients that you have at least two. You have at least one that's a plain text standard resume for online applications. And then you have another uh, that is maybe more designed, maybe more aesthetically pleasing, 
that you can use for things like printing out and taking in person uh, or directly emailing via PDF. There are some industry exceptions to, you know, what people expect in terms of how your resume comes across, uh, but I think it's still good to have the text-based resume uh, as a standard. But some of those industries are listed here. I won't read all through them. And these are the ones that when people see designed resumes come through, um, they're, they're normally a little bit more accepting of them. So, you know, we can talk about that at a later time if people have more questions. But as a very basic sort of dichotomy, you have designed resumes and not designed resumes. Your not designed resumes are gonna be the best thing for your applicant tracking system journeys. So here's an example. This is a client, uh, one, of my, one of my business clients that came to me with a resume said she wasn't getting a lot of traction uh, with her applications. And as you can see, I've kind of marked out her personal information and she also had a photo, which is something that we don't usually recommend. <laughs> um, but you can see by the background of the document that it, it's in a template. You know, we have this 25% this, uh, of the page on the side that's kind of sectioned off for the skills. You have those colors, that pattern. So she found this template online and she dropped her information in. And you know, when she would take this into interviews, of course it looks great, but she was having a really hard time getting through the applicant tracking systems, was getting auto rejects, uh, or you know, just wasn't hearing back from, from organizations. And so even though most of her information was pretty strong, we went ahead and converted her resume to a text-based format. Uh, and then she pretty soon after started seeing uh, some results. I think she's this was maybe last month and she's secured a, a new part-time position and is interviewing for another position right now. So it can make that much of a difference when you remove that formatting that's hindering your resume in these systems and allow them to be scanned properly with the, with the text-based format. And so yeah, this, this slide is an example of what her text-based version, uh, the beginning of her text-based version looked like once we made the changes. So moving right along to content, um, I think one of the most important things when it comes to content is, of course, distinguishing yourself from other candidates. And a lot of uh, resume writers and other folks who need resumes will say, you know, what is the way to do that? What is the most effective way to do it? And the power of how you write what you've done in your experience rests in the impact that you can convey. This increases in importance as you make it farther in your career. As a student, uh, if you can pull impact from your different jobs, then you know, you're, doing an, you're doing an amazing job because sometimes the appointments aren't as long. Maybe you haven't been able to stick around long enough to see the final outcome of a project that you worked on. And so I push for this across all audiences, all career levels. But as you become more seasoned in your career, it's definitely super important. You should be keeping uh, a personal list of your achievements uh, at work and different metrics that you impact and outcomes that you have because that stuff is going to feed right back into your resume. And so down below are some questions that you can use to sort of get at that, that quantification that we want to do in order to communicate our impact uh, as strongly as possible. What's the number one thing that I achieved in this position? What employer successes have I contributed to? I asked my clients for a lot of metrics. Did you improve anything? Were you able to cut down processing time by any percentage? Were you able to increase uh, any of the positive metrics by any percentage? These are the things that even if you don't know off the top of your head, hopefully you can feel comfortable asking your manager or any of the project team members that you've worked with and sort of even ballparking uh, you know, within an ethical range is still okay to have something to put on your resume. What work did I complete that I'm proud of? And what have I been publicly recognized for? Um, those are all good ways to start thinking about how do I turn this from talking about what my duty was, you know, to create a filing system, uh, and then what my impact was, which was to improve the accessibility of information by 20%. You know, there's a, those are the same bullet, but one is much more in depth and, and communicates a different message. Another thing I want to talk about regarding content is how I, rec how I recommend that different career levels handle it. So the, the main thing that I see with early career folks or students is that 
you sometimes can find people who have um, too narrow of a view of what constitutes as content. So they may say, I've only had a part-time job and you know, otherwise I've been in, in class and so I'm not sure what to put on my resume. When you're starting off in your career, you really wanna think as be as open-minded as possible about all the experiences that have contributed to your skills in whatever way. So if you're an athlete, you wanna talk about athletics and you know the amount of time that you spend training and doing other things that are contributing to skills and character uh, attributes that you're building, part-time jobs, volunteering, any academic projects. Sometimes there are just one-off projects that you've done, uh, things that you've done on the side of class or as extra credit. If you can pull some sort of substantive technical learning or uh, character-based learning out of it, then you know you should consider it, and at the very least, take it to one of your career coaches and ask if you know they think it's going to be impactful for your document. But keep an open mind to what constitutes as as experience. With my career relaunchers and my career advancers, uh, sometimes they can be a little bit sentimental and a little bit nostalgic and attached to information that may not be as relevant anymore for their current career pursuits. So I kind of advise the opposite thing, you know, have a little bit of uh, willingness to part with information that may be uh, outdated, or maybe if you're working in a different field, understand that if you take the, the information from your prior field off of your, your resume, it doesn't mean that it goes away or disappears or that it didn't help you get to where you are now. Uh, it just means that we're looking at your resume as a flyer. We're giving them the most relevant information up front. And as you secure an interview and you can go in and you can speak to any of the experiences that have made you who you are. Um, but for the purpose of snagging that interview, we don't want to bog the resume down with too many words, make it too many pages, especially if past a certain point, the uh, information either industry wise or function function wise isn't as relevant as it should be. The other thing that's really important to think about um, and kind of is it takes a, a little bit of practice to get is keyword optimization. So back to our friends, the ATS systems, um, when that scanning and that matching process happens, it, this is what's going to this is what it's going to pull from. Uh, if you look at any job description and you look at the responsibilities and the requirements, those are the areas where you're going to be able to see what some of the key priorities are for the company in that role. And if you can replicate these phrases in your resume, if you have that experience, of course, then you'll be one step closer to performing better once you submit a resume for that job. And so, uh, like I said, it's sort of an art. You have to kind of pay close attention to job descriptions and have a knack for you know, what words maybe on the back end of the ATS's priority and which ones are just words. But I wanted to give an example of how I would go through. Uh, my first job that I ever had was as a custodian. So I like to use custodians for examples. And so when I'm looking at these responsibilities, sweeping, mopping, vacuuming, seem like pretty high priority things for any custodian to know how to do. That's probably something that they're going to want to uh, confirm that I have experience with. Uh, minor repairs, uh, pests, so maybe pest control is something that I need to make sure that I include. I see the, the verb maintaining uh, several different times, so if I've maintained anything, that's probably a good one for me to replicate in my resume. Um, <clears throat> collaborating will be super important there, and in most jobs. Uh, when we get to the requirements, in addition to the words that have to match, they're also looking for a profile match, so does your career profile look like the, the type of person that they want. Do I have this, this education? Uh, mathematical skills, do I have those? You know, you know what constitutes is basic? Uh, proficient knowledge of cleaning agents, maintenance repairs, we see that maintenance word again, and then organizational skills. So both of these sections sort of work together to give you a picture of what the employer thinks is important. And once you get a baseline on your resume, as you start to apply for different jobs, you should play pay close attention to the job postings uh, and, and sort of glean any insights into the you know, keywords that you need to adopt uh, based on what's, what gets repeated 
uh, and what seems like it's critical to the function. So now moving on to format uh, and a theory that I'd like to call descending excellence. Uh, there are a lot of different resume formats. And so mostly here we're talking about standard resumes, but there are also really specific niche resumes depending on where you're applying and, and what you hope to achieve. A federal resume would be one of those types, uh, and I won't get into the different types, but I just want to point them out. And then a CV, of course, if you're applying to any sort of academic institution or research-based uh, function, then a CV may be more appropriate. And so knowing what sort of format you should be using for your resume uh, is, is usually a good first step to determine you know, how we want to align the rest of the information on it from there. I, I've talked about these terms a few times now, but relevant and impressive, those are, um, those are the keys in terms of looking at, you know, how we want to structure the information going from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. Um, on average, recruiters take about seven to eight seconds <laughs> to, to review a resume before they toss it in the yes pile or the no pile on a first review of candidates. And so the first 50% of the first page of your resume really has to, it has to work magic. You know, somebody has to look at the top half of your resume and say, I've seen enough in seven seconds to feel like this is somebody worth taking a second look at. And so you want to um, have your resume ordered in information by, in, in, a, in a descending order, by what is the most relevant and impressive relevant to the job that you're doing, and then impressive speaking back to those accolades, those achievements, those measurable outcomes. Your experience and your goals, so what you've done and what you're looking to do in the future are going to determine the format of your resume, not the other way around. I meet a lot of clients, a lot of job seekers who will come and say, I know I have to put my research on here and I know I have to put my job on here, there's some other things that I've done and I just don't know how to fit them in. Uh, you create sort of what the format is for your resume based on what you've done and you know, what narrative you need to, to tell, uh, not fitting into some uh, archetype or, or you know, standard of a resume uh, because you think that's what they would like to see. The best way that you can tell your unique story is usually taking a unique approach to how you format your document. So I want to show a couple examples of that with clients that I've worked with as well. This was one of my clients. Um, as you can see in the highlight in the summary, over five years of, of dedicated service to, to his current company. And so this is the first 50% of his resume. Now, if he was applying for a new job, then the first 50% of this resume might be different, but that wasn't his goal. His goal with this, this updated resume was to approach his manager and the leadership team at his organization and uh, make the case for a promotion and a salary increase. He feels that he's been contributing great work to the organization and that he's ready to take you know a step in his career forward to be able to uh, have more responsibility and so he wanted a document that was going to not only uh, make him look impressive <laughs> but recount the successes that he's had in the role and all of the contributions to his to his company and so when we look at this first 50 percent i think we did a good job from you know what he came to me with with putting sort of all of the evidence out there him to be able to start a conversation about, you know, this is what I've done. I love working here. I would like to keep working here. And, you know, if that's the case, then I would like to be able to, to move into a different role where I have a little bit more uh, oversight over what happens. So this is a good example of a client's goal dictating the format of their resume and not just sticking his experience and education at the top and all this other stuff because that wasn't what was most important to the narrative at this time. This is another good one, and I know I think we got some questions about this. People asked, you know, if my relevant experience is a long time ago, 
or I have experience that's not relevant that was a long time ago? And how do I order it on my resume? Do I keep stuff in? Do I take it out? Um, and so this, this client sort of gets to the, the heart of that question. This person is currently working in a retail customer service, but they are, as you can see in the summary, looking to transition into the legal field. That's what they went to school for. That's their passion. And you know they, they've made the decision and now is the time for them to go ahead and make the switch. So this is the first 50, 60% uh, of their resume. And as you can see, everything pretty much pertains to um, either the legal field or sort of an administrative uh, assistant function capacity because those were the types of roles that they were applying to. And so if you look uh, under the legal experience section, you'll see that this person's experience as a legal administrative assistant happened in 2015. And I know that's you know a long time ago, but it's the most relevant experience that they've had in the field. Uh, below that, you'll see the, the, if you could see below that, then you would see the current experience that that person has in customer service so that we know that there haven't been any uh, employment gaps and that this person has been working. But before my seven seconds is up, before you cast my resume aside, when I'm looking for this legal position, I want you to know that I do have some experience here. And so this would be a way uh, that there's, there's other types of resumes, some are chronological, some are functional, you know, based on the skills. And so this would be an example of sort of mixing styles of resume to uh, create a narrative that gets the most pertinent information out in front uh, based on you know, a career pursuit, even if the relevant experience is a little bit farther back in the past. So I wanna get into a few tips based on uh, our early career or our different career levels. So for, for our career starters, I think I talked about this earlier, but all of your information is viable information. So don't count anything out until you've had a chance to look at it all in one place, talk with a professional, uh, talk with some, some folks that you may know who've been working for a little while and get some feedback. Um, balance your soft skills with your technical skills. Sometimes I'll see you know, early career people who, because they haven't had a lot of formal experience, they will lean on you know, I'm a really hard worker, or I'm great in teams, um, but you know, most of us have some sort of technical experience to go along with that. And then the same with the other side, if you've had really technical roles, but maybe haven't done a lot of community service or something, then you know, one, it would definitely be priority to seek out that experience to add it, but try to strike as good of a balance in your narrative as you can uh, with, with describing those things. Refining your language to be professional and on par with your industry. Definitely something that I recommend visiting CCPD for. Uh, sometimes when you haven't been in a, in a full-time work environment, it can be a little difficult to speak the lingo, quote unquote, of how uh, people who are gonna review your resume will understand your contributions. So getting that second opinion and maybe some wordsmithing help from, from professionals can help. Uh, and then LinkedIn, it definitely, I, I kind of put this for all people, but I wanted to say it here at the beginning. Uh, everybody should be utilizing LinkedIn uh, to, the, to the utmost of their ability. I could do a whole separate webinar about <laughs> the ways that, to use that and how important it is. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put that plug in here to, to use LinkedIn for networking, for job searching, uh, for having a digital presence. Uh, there are so many benefits to it. And if you have one already, or if you're going to make one, then uh, create yourself a custom URL. You know, every page has a unique uh, resource locator, and LinkedIn will assign you a really assign you a really messy one with a lot of numbers and letters at the end of it. It would be great to link to your UR, to your LinkedIn on your resume, but to do that, it would be better if you had a, a shorter, more custom URL. So take that into account as you're you know putting the content into your resume. For our relaunching people or folks who are in mid-career, that impact and tangible value that I talked about, what are, what are the metrics, what are the outcomes? Uh, understanding and communicating your transferable skills. When I moved from, from marketing into higher ed, I had to figure out a way to communicate that stuff that I had been doing in the corporate world could benefit people in higher ed. And so uh, 
talking to people who are working in the field that maybe you want to get to, understanding what the priorities are there, and figuring out a way to pick the stuff that you've done that sounds similar and emphasizing that is really important. And then prioritizing the relevant information, uh, you know, especially for a millennial group, uh, folks are going to have a lot of different positions, or a lot of different jobs over the course of their life. And so as you're switching jobs, switching careers, moving in and out of different industries and functions, uh, don't be afraid to create sections in your resume that keep all of the similar experiences together and you know prioritizing those sections above ones that that may be less relevant like we saw in that in that um, most recent second resume example for my client and then for my advancers and my seasoned people cut and summarize i want to sort of keep invoking that flyer image and that flyer metaphor uh, i don't want I don't want you to get too attached to things that have happened too long ago. There's ways that we can uh, summarize, cut down, and still keep the essence of what you did. Maybe if you had an experience with from 20 years ago that uh, you want to maintain a little bit of the essence of, then if it has 10 bullets, maybe it only needs two bullets to really communicate what you want to communicate. Maybe we can extract the main phrases from that section and just put them in your skills section. There's a ton of different ways to come at getting that point across. And remember that whatever you do cut and summarize isn't gone forever. You're still taking it into your interview uh, with you and you can speak about it whenever you want. Uh, same for, for bullet number two, it kind of speaks to the same point. Uh, prioritizing the relevant information, the same as you would do in your mid-career. Find the highlights and broad narratives. And the last bullet, emphasizing high level systems and accomplishments, those two work together. Uh, especially as you're looking in, you know, into season positions, maybe 10 or more years of experience, you don't have to be so tactical on your resume anymore. You don't have to talk about, you know, what you did in front of the computer screen on the day to day basis. If you've had um, a hand in, in introducing some sweeping changes or, you know, sort of making, uh, making an impact on the organization at a departmental level or, or wider, then those are going to be the things that you know your reviewers are really going to be looking for more than the day-to-day -day, uh, work that you were doing. So try to keep the big picture in mind uh, as you're crafting your narrative. And here are some no-nos, uh, little and big ones. Photos of yourself, like we said, there's a bunch of different reasons why this isn't uh, <laughs> this isn't appropriate or a good idea. But just think about it from a privacy aspect. Um, so, you know, in addition to that, they, they, they will bust, bust up your resume in an ATS. So let's get rid of those. Addresses, same idea, privacy. It's also pretty unnecessary. Nobody should be sending you anything via mail most times. And so um, you don't have to have your address on there. I delete a lot of addresses and that's just another line that we have to put in more relevant information. So. Uh, References, these are not needed on your resume. They should be on a separate document. Most job applications these days will actually just have you input them into the online application, but it's good to keep a separate document with all of your, you know, up to date reference contacts in there. And then you can submit that, you know, as its own file if you need to, but don't put these on the resume. You don't have to put references available by request or anything like that. You know, when people are ready for them, they'll ask for them. So that phrase is sort of obsolete. Uh, long narrative blocks of text. You wanna try to have some white space. You wanna be succinct in your descriptions and get to the point. Uh, the longer a resume is, the less likely somebody is to read it. And um, you know, the messier it is and the, the more tight the text is, the harder it is to decipher. So we don't wanna you know, send people away on account of those things. Word for word, repetitive information. Sometimes people will have progressive jobs at the same company where they were duplicating some responsibilities or a similar job at a different company. And they'll say, I was basically doing the same thing. So I'll just throw this back in there. Uh, it's wasting space. Every original role that you have, you wanna use it to communicate either a progression or something different. Uh, if you feel like you didn't really do anything different, then you know there are ways that resume writers and career coaches can help you to organize that information so that it doesn't take up much space, but don't have two separate sections on your resume that are saying exactly the same thing. Uh, 
uh, your degree and your major titles. Sometimes people get a little confused about what the name of their degree is or maybe how to properly um, name their degree or their major. You want to be really clear with this. A lot of recruiters are searching for people by major. And if you have a BA in business as opposed to a BS in business, that communicates something totally different from, from school to school across the nation. So you want to be really sure if you have a BBA, a BA, a BS, and then what exactly your degree is called. Uh, it matters more than you know. Post nominals, which is your credentials. So <laughs> I know, especially my MBA folks, I don't know if I have any MBA folks on the call, but y'all love to say John Doe comma MBA. Uh, when you add post nominals to your name for your resume purposes, uh, it of course tacks onto your name and it can just come out wonky on the other side. If you wanna put your post nominals uh, on your resume, then drop it down a line from, from where your name is or just put your education closer to the top so people can see it. Um, but that's, uh, that's not something that is, is as helpful as it seems for the computer scanning portion. Now on your send via email or printout resume, doesn't matter as much, but for the one that you're submitting online, keep, keep your name to itself. Header and footer. A lot of people will use header and footer to try to save space and drop other information in. That's another one of those things that ATSs can't read. So I actually had a client who... <laughs> was submitting a, a great resume. I didn't, they didn't even need my help and they couldn't get any callbacks. And when I got their resume to review it, it had all of their name and contact information in their header. And I was pretty sure that their resume was coming out on the other side and people were looking at all the, the content and just didn't know whose name it was or how to contact them. So um, keep everything in the page, just text-based, middle of the page, no funny business, and you'll, be, you'll have a good shot at whatever you're trying to do. And then like I spoke about before, no no's for ATS compliance, text boxes, shapes, objects, tables, doing multiple columns within a page. A lot of times people will, you know, manipulate the format of their page to create columns to maybe put their skills section in columns or something like that. There's, there's, many different ways that you can achieve what you're trying to do, but don't, it'll, when the page scans in the ATS, it'll jumble up all your words because they read right to left on a straight horizontal plane. So you don't want to give them too many different levels to, to try to read across. Um, yeah, okay. So that's it for my content. Um, but this is the page, the, the URL to, to Mercer's resume guidelines. Um, like I said, I used to work with CCPD and they have you know, some of the best information here that's available for you to get started in terms of your resume writing tips, samples, uh, checklists. And it's super, super important that you review this stuff and can uh, work on your resume a little bit and sort of get it up to a standard before you upload it into Handshake. Uh, the staff here is going to review everything before it's approved in Handshake and goes to employers. But uh, the more work that you can do to get yours, you know, up to up to code, so to speak, um, will be a faster process for it to get approved in Handshake. And so you can go out and start applying to some jobs. Uh, I really appreciate you all giving me a chance to share a little bit of insight. And I'm going to hang around so that we can answer some questions after the presentation closes. Thank you, Kim and Cindy. Thank you so much, Hugh. Just um, all valuable information. And I love that Hugh used to work in our department and actually helped author those guidelines. And so um, they definitely reiterate uh, many of the same points he has already made, which are such important industry standards. I just want to take just a minute to remind everybody um, that Handshake is the premier career development platform offered at Mercer University. It's free and it's available to students as well as all alums. So this is something we want you to take advantage of. If there's any alum listening to today's webinar or perhaps the recording, you certainly may request a Handshake account. And uh, all we do is verify your Mercer degree. And, and usually it's within two business days or possibly three that you would be granted your Handshake account. For students, you have a Handshake account to access usually by the second day of your first enrollment period at Mercer. We want you to start taking advantage of that platform and really thinking about your career development from the very beginning of your Mercer experience. 
So if you have not logged into your Handshake account yet, we want you to do that as soon as possible. The URL is here. It's very simple. You can bookmark it or put it to your favorites. Um, it's mercer.joinhandshake.com. And so real quick, just a word about the Handshake resume review. A lot of people don't know or don't realize that when you upload a resume into the platform, it automatically prompts the Center for Career and Professional Development staff to give a review. And that's because we have a setting that does not allow the resume to go live uh, for employers to view until it's been reviewed by a staff member. But you can upload multiple resumes. As far as I know, there are no limits. I've had a student who's had 14 resumes in Handshake all named very well according to their pursuit. And I do recommend a good naming system in that regard. The employers do get to see the names of your documents, so keep that in mind and so do we. But as soon as you upload a resume and also I'll quickly mention cover letters, our staff will automatically review. There's two categories. There's one that's basically a green light. If you get the word reviewed, back it's written in green usually that means your document was approved as is if you get a notification back that says changes suggested usually in red the document needs edits before it can be seen by an employer or attached to an application inside of handshake this is a great way to get a quick review without necessarily having to email our staff or maybe um, making a full 30 or 60 minute appointment so i strongly recommend this process and Again, like Hugh said, take a look at the guidelines and bring your document to a certain standard as much as you can. We certainly don't expect the document to be perfect when it comes into Handshake. We realize that there's usually a round or two of revisions, but it can be quite frustrating if we have to go through extra rounds of revisions based on just those basic standards he mentioned. So take a look at the guidelines and do your best before you submit. And real quick, just want to give a little shout out for social media. If you have time now to grab your phone or your other device and pick your favorite social media platform and follow our department, we would appreciate that. That's a great compliment to your Handshake platform where you can see announcements and happenings in your daily feed. And so pull up your favorite social media and make a post about today's webinar or about um, something you've learned today. And if you wouldn't mind, use hashtag connect to your future, which is our uh, favorite hashtag since we believe the career development services we provide do connect you to your future. I'm going to turn it over so, to you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Kim and Hugh, for this wonderful webinar you all presented today. At this time, we'll be taking any uh, questions you all may have. You can go ahead and type those into the chat feature, and I'll be happy to read them out for either Hugh or um, Kim to review. So we have our first one, where can we access a template or ATS auspicious format for writing the resume? Um, he says, I know you mentioned that Word documents and templates online aren't the best for ATS to accept and interpret the resume. So what would you recommend in that regard? Yeah, I would recommend writing it yourself. And I don't mean that to sound like tongue in cheek or snarky, but um anything that you download you can't be sure of what came baked into the file already and so um it kind of sounds like a lot starting from scratch or you know copying your text over from another resume and, and and formatting from scratch but i promise it'll be worth it in the long run i do a lot when i get clients with who come from having ats resumes i'll control c everything and then i'll paste without formatting and I'll take my time going through like just like the lines and spaces of creating the blocking, um, you know, to make all the information sort of spaced out in its own right. Um, but I try to encourage people as much as I can just to stray away if they want to use the resume to submit online, just to stay away from the templates altogether because it's it's almost like a better safe than sorry situation. I do have another question. Mm -hmm. How does one handle long gaps in employment on a resume? Say maybe this person had been ill or they went back to school first uh, full time, et cetera. For sure. So having really precise timelines for everything that you've done. Uh, so, you know, the example of going back to school, if you have a gap in work, but 
you can show that you were in school during that time by having the month in the year that you started, month in the year that you finished. And that, of course, takes account for some of it. Um, for, you know, other gaps, the way that you actually order your information, like, you know, if you had a long gap in between the last time that you were working and now, then you can use a more relevant experience to, to put at the top of your resume. Um, and so it's not making the gap go away, but it's catching their attention with something that's super relevant before they notice it. And I would absolutely recommend, you know, having a cover letter in those cases where you have extenuating circumstances to your career profile, having a cover letter that helps sort of bring some clarity to whatever, um, you know, idiosyncrasies that, that one might find in your profile. That way they can pair those together. And if they look and say, oh, this person looks pretty good, but I don't know, they weren't working for five years, then their cover letter can explain. And maybe sometimes in small doses in your professional summary, uh, can explain, um, you know, I was a stay at home parent or uh, I was traveling abroad or I was taking care of, you know, this person. Like there are ways that you can get that across more effectively um, in a cover letter and pair that with your resume. <clears throat> Thank you, Hugh. We have another question. I know you mentioned not to include degrees or major titles as part of your name. Do you recommend or think it's beneficial to have a section highlighting your education and should the years you attended be included? Um, yes, so definitely, you know, want to have a, a section for your education, especially if it's relevant to your field. And normally I will do the year that you finished whatever program that was, uh, except like in the last case that I was just talking about, if there's some kind of work gap, then, and, you know, we want to show the full time that you were in school and we can include that. But yes, otherwise, an, a dedicated education section is good in the years that you graduate uh, or that you, you know, completed whatever sort of education or continuing education it was, uh, th that's very helpful as well. If you really want to have your post nominals, like for instance, some people have certifications, like there's a Society for Human Resource Professionals and they go a lot by their post nominals. So, um, and I see that you asked about it being in the, first 50% of the resume, so I'll get to that. Uh, the, certifi the certified, people with certifications really like to use their post nominals for your purpose of an online resume. It's not that you have to take them out of the first part of your contact info. It's just that you might wanna drop them down below a line below your name. So mine would say, you know, Hugh Hunter, drop down a line, certified professional resume writer, parentheses, CPRW, and that would be a better way of handling that. Um, in terms of your education and where it's placed on your resume, it depends on a lot. And so I would definitely you know, reach out to a, your nearest professional to sort of see what might make sense for your case. When you're a, a new career starter, I think it should be closer to the top because that's brand. You know, any school that you represent, it's gonna be, it's gonna have like goodwill and favor with where you're applying. Um, and also you may want to include some relevant courses and you're sort of like close by that information if you don't have a ton of experience. Um, if you have a longer work experience, uh, work history, then sometimes that education section is not as relevant. There are more relevant things that, that should come before it in order to paint the picture of who you are as a professional. So um, it really just depends on what type of role you're trying to get and what your work history is. So I know that wasn't a very straightforward answer, but there's like multiple things you have to consider. And based on the makeup of the rest of your resume, those two phrases, right? Is this the most relevant and most impressive thing? And if so, then I should move it up. Uh, and if it's a little bit less relevant or impressive than something else, then, you know, I'll put it behind that. Great. And also uh, in terms of education, Hugh, um, do you suggest listing a GPA or the Dean's President's list on our resume? That's a good question. Uh, so uh, another thing I want to say about education is if you're applying to jobs in education, then almost always put your education at the top as well. That's like one caveat because schools love to see where the people that they hire went to school. Um, but in terms of your different educational accolades, president's list, GPAs, there are certain industries that are really, really going to lean on that. So if you want to work in consulting, accounting, uh, finance, those are uh, higher ed, those are the people that are going to pull your transcripts before you get hired. <laughs> and so you, you, you might be better off, um, you know, sending your 
sending your GPA, just putting it on your resume so that they can you know, have an idea up front and you can impress upon them, especially if your, your GPA is pretty good. Uh, I think generally, you know, 3.0 and up is pretty good to, to go ahead and, and put there. But there are certain organizations that we know have, um, you know, standards. And so there's a there's a local company in Macon that we know used to have a 3.5 sort of standard for one of their programs. And so we would tell students, if you, hey, if you're applying and you have a 3.5 or above, and put that front and center on your resume so that when they see it, uh, you know, they won't have to wonder about it. And, you know, they can already have that information in their decision making process for you up against other candidates. So, yeah, it, it can be a good thing to put, um, especially if it's, you know, immediately sort of relevant to what your career pursuit is or the company that you're applying to. Uh, generally, the further that you get away from school, the less it's probably going to matter. Uh, and, you know, me as a resume writer, if, if there's a whole line taking up GPA and president's list and dean's list and somebody's been working for 10 years or more, I'm probably going to delete that line because there's something more relevant that we can use in its stead. We do have another question regarding a cover letter. Mm -hmm. As far as the cover letter goes, is there a specific template for a cover letter? Is that um, ATS user friendly? So if my memory serves me correctly, there's a great template for a cover letter on the CCPD website. There's also some information um, around, you know, what you're supposed to put in that cover letter. These are subjective as well. There's a lot of different strategies and approaches. I like to recommend that candidates do a good mix of their soft skills and their technical skills in their cover letter, just kind of giving more color. You don't want it to be repetitious, uh, you know, to your resume. You want it to expand on that a little bit and say things that you maybe couldn't say in the in the space of the, 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 the previous document. So definitely head over to the CCPD site. There's some guidance there as well as a good base template that you can use. Uh, and that would be, you know, ATS compliant as well. We'll give it a few more moments. Should anyone have any more questions they would like to ask you or Kim? And at this time, this will conclude today's webinar. We appreciate you all attending.